This is Logan Seculo, and yes, this is not a rerun. President Biden off the ballot in yet another state. Keeping you informed and engaged, now more than ever, this is Seculo. We want to hear from you. Share and post your comments or call 1-800-684-3110. And now your host, Logan Seculo. That's right. You heard me right. Or maybe you're looking at a title on YouTube. Maybe you're looking at a title on Rumble and you saw, oh, maybe this is just a repeat from a couple days ago. But no, no, no. President Biden currently now off the ballot in yet another state in a far, I would say, or Ohio, probably not the friendliest. I'd say maybe one of the least friendly probably states to President Biden, maybe one of the deepest red states in the country. And that, of course, is the state of Alabama. And that just is another situation where they weren't paying attention, kept their eye off the ball. And Will, what have we here? Right, and this comes in the form of a letter from the Secretary of State of Alabama, Wes Allen, and he wrote to Randy Kelly, who's the chair of the Alabama Democrat Party, it has recently come to my attention that the Democrat National Convention is currently scheduled to convene on August 19th, 2024, which is after the state of Alabama's statutory deadline for political parties to provide a certificate of nomination for president and vice president on August 15th. Now, the statute reads no later than the 82nd day next preceding the fixed day for the election. So 82 days before November 5th, the parties are supposed to, by state law in Alabama, certify who their candidates will be. Right. This is yet another state in which... I can only imagine there will be more to come as secretaries of state start looking at these deadlines and matching it up with the August 19th start of the DNC and say, hey, wait a second, you're going to miss here. Yeah, <laughs> you're some, not going to be able to certify your candidate. In some ways, it's it's great news. In some ways, it's just funny to deal with because, like you said, they spent years trying to keep President Trump off the ballot. And they themselves, the Democrat elite, weren't paying attention to their own rules and now we're having to scramble just a few months away from a general election to make sure the current president, the incumbent, is on the ballot. I think it's hilarious. I'd love to hear from you. What does this say about the modern-day Democratic Party? What does this say about the Biden administration and now the Biden campaign? Do you feel like this is just another indicator in America that they have kept their eye off the ball, whether that's at the southern border, whether that is any of these crises happening in the Middle East, whether that's all the wars, whether it's all the spending, that now they can't even help themselves because they are not even paying attention to follow their own rules. They just assume because he's President Biden, he's going to waltz his way onto the ballot. And look, what do you think? Should we just allow it? Should Alabama do the right thing? Rick Grinnell was on earlier in the week. He just suggested yes. As conservatives, as people who actually care about these kind of issues and don't want to be just ultra partisan all the time. Yeah, I'm in the mid, figure it out, fix it. Because if you are the candidate, you should be on the ballot. However, we are living in a time where political norms have been thrown out the window. And this would certainly not be the case uh, in most big blue states. Some of them maybe. Heck, you probably have a Gavin Newsom saying you shouldn't do this. But other than him, <laughs> weirdly, the ones that try to play both sides here, you would have a lot of states, including the ones like Colorado and Vermont, the ones that already have had these issues, saying, nope, President Trump, off the ballot. What should we do in this situation if you were uh, you're making this decision? Do you do the right thing? Or do you just, you know, make them live by the, the rules and deal with the cards that they were dealt? 1-800-684-3110. I'd love to hear from you. 1-800-684-3110. I'm actually going to take these calls in the next segment. So if you want to discuss... The fact that right now, President Biden off the ballot in the state of Alabama and off the ballot in the state of Ohio. Love to hear your thoughts. 1-800-684-3110. A little bit later in the show, we are going to discuss that the law that just got passed in Arizona about life and abortion. And we're going to discuss all of that, how the ACLJ was involved. We've got CeCe Heil joining us and what it means moving forward. Obviously, there's some controversy there. We're going to discuss it. You know, really hammer it out. That's going to come up a little bit later followed by my brother joining us live from Washington, D.C. at the half hour. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. 
The certification deadline, which is 82 days before the election, has been on the books for years. But this year, the Democratic convention comes four days after the deadline, potentially leaving the party's presidential ticket off Alabama ballots. Well, today, the Alabama Secretary of State sent a letter to the state Democratic Party. He warned that if their presidential candidates are not certified before the convention, they could not be included on the November ballot under the law. Allen is calling this a courtesy, according to Alabama law. You have 15 days to submit paperwork naming a candidate, which in this case is 82 days before the general election, which happens to fall on August 15th. Now, he says the reason for the letter is he noticed the Democratic National Convention falls August 19th through the 22nd, an event where the party officially announces their candidates. And if his office does not receive that certification by the deadline, you won't see Biden-Harris names on the ballot in Alabama. I can't speak for anybody that came before me. All I know is that I'm the Secretary of State of Alabama, and I am administering the election laws of this state. And uh, it'd be my advice to DNC, RNC, everybody to get those certificates and to certify those names uh, to our office by August 15th. It was shocking um, at first, of course, and it's been a lot of the buzz today, um, even on the Alabama Senate floor. Um, but here's the beautiful thing about serving in the legislature. We have the opportunity to change the law. I heard what the Secretary of State said, that he is following the letter of the law, and I don't doubt that. But I have a bill being drafted right now, um, and we have nine more legislative days in order to pass the legislation to ensure that we as Democrats do have a nominee that's on the ballot. The Democratic Party has been aware of this potential problem for some time, and they are currently looking at a couple of solutions, which could include certifying President Biden and Vice President Harris before the convention. Welcome back to Secular. This is Logan Secular. My brother Jordan will be joining us. Uh, the second half hour live from Washington, D.C. with a critical update there. We'll also be talking about that Arizona life law that just got put back into place. Uh, we're going to discuss all that coming up, but we are still discussing the fact that President Biden currently off the ballot in the state of Alabama due to essentially a clerical error, if you will, by the Biden campaign booking the convention too late in the game. Uh, we just had, if you're watching on YouTube or Rumble or on ACLJ.org, you just saw uh, some highlights from different news sources. One was an Alabama uh, representative saying, hey, I'm already drafted a bill to fix this because, look, we still got nine legislative days before we take a break from summer. Nine days. So if this hadn't come up in the next week, two weeks, let's say, of work weeks, there's a good chance, a real chance, President Biden not on the ballot. Let's go ahead and start taking some phone calls. I want to hear from Ronald first. He's watching on Rumble. Living in South Carolina. Ronald, you're on the air. Yes, thank you for taking my call. Yeah, um, enjoying the show greatly. And and what I come to find out from all that is happening is that every trick and everything that they threw at Trump uh, to try and destroy him and try to get him out of these uh, ballots on each of the states and things have literally come back on them in droves. I mean, it is getting to the point to where it is ridiculous everything they've tried now they're going to have to wade through and try and to nagle their way out of well and ronald it does seem that this is the latest symptom of trump derangement syndrome where you saw you have seen for years almost eight years now that democrats have done everything they can to try and either get president trump out of office while he still was sitting president and now to keep him from running again. But when you have a, a political party like the DNC, their entire role is to set the convention, to structure things. It's, it is separate from even the Biden campaign. Yeah. So their one job is to make sure that they get ballot access in all 50 states by certifying at the right times. They coordinate with the campaign when these filings are going to happen to make sure that their nominee is on the ballot. Where were the teams of lawyers at the DNC? Do they not have a, a running tally of dates of when they have to certify to make sure that their paperwork yeah, is in on time? There's not an Excel document somewhere floating around that says they need to do this. It's absurd. But he's right. Ronald's right. Cause you have even situations like the uh, documents. You know, they make a big deal. If this was no one, you know, no one could believe that there was classified documents right. in Marlowe. And then it's like, guess what? Classified documents. 
uh, at the Biden, every sort, in, in what felt like random hotel rooms across right. the country. Uh, this is what not obviously not actually random hotel rooms across the country, but it felt like they kept being discovered next in a random place Corvette, next to the in, the in the garage under a 1997 yeah. television to yeah, TV. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's like <laughs> for a rainy day. Got to got to <laughs> crank out those old VHSs. Let's go to Jim, who's calling, watching on YouTube. Uh, Jim, you're on the air in Kansas. Now, thank you, gentlemen, for taking my call. I'm in favor of keeping Biden on the ballot. I like to see a debate between Kennedy, Trump, and Biden, if that could be possible. Absolutely, Jim. I think that I would like to see that as well. And I think if you see our RFK having some pops here and there, uh, you may see that happen. I mean, if he starts getting to a certain threshold, Kennedy, uh, is there a point where he gets on that stage? Right now, the Biden administration has not even acknowledged that he's running. Uh, they have all been solely focused on Trump. And now, I mean, you could say that you know, Trump is the only real viable uh, opponent in terms right. of actual numbers here. But I would love to see it. Um, I remember the debates, even as I was young at the time, but uh, between George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, and Ross Perot, yeah. and then and even uh, later, later on. Right. Yeah. And that these, these things have happened in recent yeah. history. The problem here is that I don't think either Trump nor Biden really want to go through the process of the Presidential Debate Commission because of how poorly the debates were run back in 2020. Uh, the moderators that are picked, you never feel like you're, you're getting someone in there that's asking hard questions of both people. And it just, it doesn't feel like the events that they used to be where you got a clash of ideas. Instead, it seems like a, uh, a referee that is tipping their hand to one side instead yeah. of the other. Yeah, it's always a mess now, unfortunately. We saw a little bit better on some of the more recent debates, but I think it's going to be a, a long time till you... Maybe you'll have a president... I think you probably will have a Trump-Biden debate. I think there'll probably be one, maybe. But also, I could see him going, this just doesn't sway enough people, so it's not worth it. Let's continue on. Take some calls. So many of you are calling in on this topic i want to get to as many of you as possible next up rachel who's calling in texas listen on the radio hey you're watching on youtube right now because i see there a lot i'm gonna ask you to uh, hit the thumbs up subscribe but also check in in the chat i want to know what state you're watching from because look i know there's probably a lot of people in alabama and ohio i'd love to hear from you guys but specifically i just want to know throw it in the comments uh, give me a city and state where you're watching i really would love to see how widespread our show is getting on youtube and on rumble rachel though you are on the air in the state of Texas. Go ahead. Hey, if Alabama and Ohio, um, they, they need to stick it to the DNC because if this were Donald Trump, they've got whole legal cases hinging on technicalities. There's no way that they would allow this if it were Trump. I, I think you're right, Rachel, and I think that's sort of the big conundrum we've had. It's sort of like impeachment, which is the idea of do you stoop to their level? It's the if you go if they go low, you go lower uh, situation. That is the uh, where we've kind of been pushing against, and I think for the betterment of the country, we should be pushing against that. However, I can't tell you that it doesn't make it a little harder when you see what they'll put people through. Well, and the difference here is that it's not like these secretaries of state are like the secretary of state of Colorado that was actively trying to remove the candidate from the ballot. The secretaries of state in these respective states, both in Ohio and Alabama, are saying, this is our law. It exists. We didn't make this up just to stop the DNC because we knew when their their convention was being held. No, the law was on the books, and the DNC scheduled their convention in spite of that law. Yeah. So it's not the same as saying that, oh, conservatives are now trying to take Biden off the ballot. No, they're just saying, here's our law, and actually, we believe in the rule of law, unlike many Democrats. Right. And so we're going to follow that until we find uh, some sort of uh, amenable way to get around that, if that's what you're looking for. Whether that be you having a nominating convention actually before your convention date or whether the state legislature changes the law. But that's how America works. That's how laws work. It doesn't just say, well, the law says this, but, you know, he is the the sitting president, so we're just going to let it slide. No, then you'd have legal challenges saying you can't just change the law unilaterally. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, phone lines are jammed, but keep them coming. Also, I love all these comments. I'm watching uh, on YouTube and on Rumble. I'm seeing all your comments and where you're checking in from. And I didn't even think about this. And I'm going to say this is an important work of the ACLJ that's happening here. Because of people, places like YouTube and Rumble, we are actually being seen and heard worldwide. So 
these American ideals that we hold so close can actually impact the world because of this broadcast. So if you're watching internationally, I see some of you are, hit that up as well. Put that in the comments, not just your city and state. Obviously, if you're watching in a different country, let me know. I see everybody checking in from Georgia, from Central Florida, from Maine, from Michigan, Arizona, California. It just goes on and on. Keep it coming. I love seeing it. It actually gives us the momentum to keep going, keep pushing forward. In a minute, I'm going to talk to you about our Life and Liberty Drive. And in the next segment, we're going to be discussing critical case or critical law that just got passed that we were a part of in Arizona. Let's go ahead and go back to the phone calls. Let's go to Rebecca, who's calling in New Hampshire on line six. Rebecca, you're on the air. Hello. Thank you for taking my call. No problem. Uh, revenge is the Lord, uh, so it's not ours. That's what the Bible tells us. Yeah, and I, I, I assume that you're, you're saying just based on, like, the political situation here. Like, don't take out our frustrations. Uh, you know, let God handle that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I can see your point there, and I don't disagree with you. I think that is the right thing to do. However, as Will pointed out, this is not revenge in the sense of the traditional sense, where we are not, no one, no Republican is out there right now saying, uh, push for Biden. I mean, there are people, but that are legitimate saying Biden shouldn't be on the ballot. They just didn't follow the rules That's that they correct. set. Yeah, and, and to Rebecca's point, that is very similar to what Rick Rennell was saying, is yeah. that we actually want it to be a fair election because yeah. we want to win yeah. an election. Conservatives tend to want to win an election on the ideas. Democrats many times want to win on technicalities or by getting an unfair advantage. And so to Rebecca's point, it, this there it, oh, could be moments for revenge by certain state legislators that maybe say, hey, we're not even going to take up the bill. If one is put forward, like we know is being put forward in Alabama, and probably one will soon be put forward in Ohio to try to amend the law. That's also not unprecedented, by the way. I believe in some states in 2020, because of the way that the conventions were, some states had to give an exception to the Republican Party for Donald Trump to appear on the ballot because they were trying to figure out how to do a convention. And we did like the remote conventions. And so technically the convention was later. And some of these states did in that time. Uh, afford that exception or exemption to President Trump, but it was done through the legislature the right way. I do want to tell you, we are right in the middle of our Life and Liberty Drive for the month of April, and the focus on life is really strong today. In the next segment, hey, stay on hold, by the way, if you're on hold for this, this topic, we'll get back to you. Uh, the fight for life has never been more important, and we're going to talk about how the ACLJ was involved in that critical situation in Arizona and what it all looks like. We're going to break it down coming up with CeCe Heil in this next segment, because we are fighting to defend the unborn in all 50 states. You can be a part of it. Go to ACLJ.org. If you can, become an ACLJ champion. That's someone who supports the work of the ACLJ each and every month. We've seen the impact already, and it's unbelievable. ACLJ.org. Be right back. We got uh, contacted by a church in, in uh, Hertford, North Carolina, that was told there are districts within their city that are, quote, no church zone. So this new church they're ready to start looking for land to Let's buy a building. There, yeah. yeah, so it's a new church, <laughs> and they want to buy. A, they want to build a building. So right. they're going to find land in the community they want to build in, and then they find out in the community that they want to build in. There's literally maybe there's land that they want, but it's a no church zone. Explain that to people. These no church zones are actually the commercial districts where they do allow similar uses for libraries, museums, theaters, art galleries, and restaurants, but specifically deny any use to the churches. So we had a client contact us, a church that wants to uh, get a building and start a church there, and saying, basically, we cannot do that. And what made matters worse is, even in the zones where they do allow churches, they only allow them if you get a conditional use permit. So never as a right does a church have just a right by zoning laws to build a church. So we sent in a demand letter, but they did not res respond. They were supposed to respond by April 3rd. And so we were preparing to go to court on this. And uh, lo and behold, we last night, the yes. city does respond. Tell, city tell, tell everybody what happened with, and, and what they told That's the ACLJ. Right. At about 9 o'clock last night, we did receive a letter um, from the town saying that they are going to propose an amendment to their current zoning ordinance that will allow churches to operate as a permitted use under the same circumstances and regulations as other comparable um, permitted uses. So that was a, a very good victory and in a short amount of time. And that shows how, you know, we can we can jump in on these cases and um, let these towns know and these cities know this is what the law is and 
they they usually comply and they want to do what's right. And here we have that same victory. Welcome back to Secular. We are going to change things up topic-wise right now, but if you're on hold and you want to talk about Biden being off the ballot in the state of Alabama, we're going to continue that discussion a little bit later in the broadcast. Jordan will be joining us live from Washington, D.C. But I do want to shift to some work that's going on with the ACLJ and how we were involved. You may have seen the headlines yesterday that the law, the what they were calling the, the Civil War era 1800s law uh, on abortion and on life and the protection of life has gone into play and there's really important things you need to know about how we were involved in that, how the ACLJ got involved in it. Because C.C. Hiles joining us, you can maybe break down a little bit of how this works because people probably saw, okay, well, there was already a law in the books. Why was there a lawsuit and how were we involved? Right. So like a lot of states um, before Roe v. Wade, a lot of states understood that they had a compelling interest to protect preborn life. And so there were many states that restricted abortion, did not allow abortion. And as in here, Arizona had that same restriction except to save the life of the mother. And so that law had literally been, actually their intent, even in, like you said, the 1800s, the legislature proved that their intent to protect preborn life since the late 1800s, and then they codified that in the early 1900s. So that law was in place until Roe v. Wade. And when Roe v. Wade came and everyone thinks, okay, now it's, you know, the the Supreme Court. Yes. Supreme Court has stated that you can have an abortion. So then the law gets enjoined. So that's it's stopped. It's not being enforced. Um, And then, of course, we have Dobbs. So 1973, you have Roe, then you have Dobbs and Dobbs gets rid of Roe. And so this law gets reinstated, and, of course, then it gets attacked. Yeah, and it's not dissimilar to some of the states, even the state of Tennessee that we're in, which is seemingly just a life of the mother exception, right. which I think most people are probably okay with. And other than that, uh, that's pretty much it in, in the state of Arizona. But now it's become, like you said, a controversial topic. We got involved. We were there to support it. Yes. And now uh, the fight sort of reignites. Right. So we did file an amicus brief. And we argued that Arizona has a long history of protecting innocent pre-born life. And Over the, 100 years. <laughs> that's exactly yeah. right. And the court really agreed. And I, I just want to kind of read what the holding was. The legislature has demonstrated its consistent design to restrict elective abortion to the degree permitted by the Supremacy Clause and an unwavering intent since 1864 to prescribe elective abortions absent a federal constitutional right precisely what it intended and accomplished. To date, our legislature has never affirmatively created a right to or independently authorized elective abortion. And that's what we argued, and that's what they found. And so now they are pointing that unless something else is done, this law is in effect. And and to some degree, we know that even before Roe was overturned through the Dobbs decision, you did see many states that went beyond Roe, whether it was New York or we knew uh, the Governor Northam that was pushing for a late term uh, bill in Virginia uh, when that famous comment about uh, let the uh, baby be born and right. then we'll decide what to do with it, that states have the opportunity, if they had a law on the books, to go back and change that if that were the will of the state. That's right. And in states like Arizona, where that didn't happen, the court rightly holds, it sounds like, that yes. they're saying they had an opportunity to change this if that was their will, right. even under Roe, but they didn't. They just relied on Roe, so therefore we can infer right. that the will of the legislature remains, right. at least until now, that this law should remain on the books. Right. And then, you know, the legislature, especially in states, that's the will of the people because, you know, it's a closer um kind of state to the people and what the people decide. And we see that in more conservative states. You do have more, you know, restrictive uh, laws that are that are pro-life, that are actually affirming life. And so it's a state battle. We've known that. We've known when Dobbs came down that there would be state battles. And we've seen this here in Arizona. But we're we're happy with the results. It follows along what we argued in our amicus brief. And we think the court got it right. And just so people know, this isn't just happening in Arizona. The ACLJ right. is out there now in, in essentially many states. I mean, in theory, all 50 states at this point trying to fight for life protection because we know that once Dobbs you know, or Roe was overturned with Dobbs, yes. that it wasn't like, and it was, look, it's hard to, to tell people this and to understand, 
that it wasn't like abortion laws now universally all are going to go be like Arizona. Right. Uh, they're some of the most extreme all, all over the country right now. And that's why you're seeing this debate happening. Yes. You're seeing a President Trump have to put out a statement and President Biden doing an abortion tour and RFK saying, well, I don't think there should be laws, but I do think every abortion is a tragedy. You're having people having to walk a line now to try to not only win people over because it's become such a big issue, but it's become an individual state issue. But we're there every time. Every single time. And we knew that and we were prepared for it. And we are watching um, what all 50 states are doing. And that's, again, at the state level. But sometimes it's even city councils are, you know, affecting laws that we are involved and engaged in and watching. And so every chance that we have, uh, you know, a time that we can step in and protect life, we have done that and continue to do that. And I think we're filing, I think, another amicus brief on Monday. On Monday, uh, on the and life we have issue. A, a cert petition uh, later in the month that will be going before the Supreme Court to try to get a case taken up where it's a free speech case with uh, a buffer zone law, which restricts the ability to have free speech near and around abortion clinics. So that work continues on. But I also wanted to bring up, because we are in an election year, yep. we know that many of these states that maybe have a law like Arizona that they're not necessarily trying to go the legislative route, but now they're trying to get signatures to put it on the ballot in November, right. hoping to make it a political issue, which will drive, uh, as they've seen work in some of the other states, it will drive people on the left that are more pro-abortion to the polls and hopefully help deliver a victory for President Biden. As a matter of fact, I got an email from the DNC. Yes, I subscribe to their emails so that I can watch what <laughs> they're right. doing. Course, yes. But Stay I informed. got a I got a DNC email this morning that was listing states that are potentially going to have restrictive abortion measures. And it's there are places like Arizona, Georgia, North Carolina and Wisconsin, swing states for the election that they're highlighting Right. because of this right and i think there's maybe 11 states that will possibly could have ballot initiatives and you know again that's where we will come in and we will educate on those because we see especially with ballot initiatives wording is key and they try to be very confusing with the wording yeah but i'm seeing that actually in the comments the amount of people that are commenting in from where they're coming from and i love seeing that but a lot of these states that potentially have it on the ballot where it looks like abortion will be on the ballot are a lot of places that people are checking in from so a lot of aclj supporters uh that includes florida new york maryland Arizona, Arkansas, Colorado, Missouri, Montana, Nebraska, Nevada. We'll flip over this page here. And South Dakota. So a lot of states, and that could get more, and we're going to be there each and every time. And I couldn't tell you that this is a really crucial time for the fight for life, and that is why during this Life at Liberty Drive, we need your support. And as we head to the break, know that we have a second half hour of this broadcast. I see a lot of the comments, or I see a lot of the people calling in right now listening on the radio. Your radio station may not carry the full hour. Log on over to ACLJ.org. Find us broadcasting on YouTube or Rumble right now. You should do that because we have a whole second half hour. My brother's joining us from Washington, D.C. Give us a report from there. But it is the Life and Liberty Drive right now. All donations are effectively doubled because every donation is matched during these drives, which is amazing. There's amazing people like you out there ready to match. We urgently need your support. As you said, we are fighting in all 50 states to defend the life of the unborn. And with major wins now in Arizona, we had major wins in Florida. We could use your support today to keep us in these fights. And you can join us in these fights also by becoming an ACLJ champion. That's someone who says, I am dedicated to the cause of the ACLJ and everything that you stand for. And I'm going to do that each and every month on a recurring basis. Obviously, individual donations are fantastic, but if you can become an ACLJ champion, we are seeing the dramatic impact of that each and every day right now, seeing how many people have joined, almost 21,000 of you. We couldn't do this work without you. Go to ACLJ.org. If you're on hold, stay on hold. We'll get to your calls in just a little bit. Folks, last year we launched our first ACLJ Life and Liberty Drive, and even we couldn't anticipate how successful it would become. Thanks to you, our ACLJ members and champions, the rights to life and liberty are the cornerstones of our constitutional republic, but they are under attack. That is why we're proud to announce the return of the ACLJ Life and Liberty Drive. This month, we're redoubling our efforts to beat back the radical left's attacks on your constitutional freedoms and to defend the sanctity of human life, not just here at home, but around the world, the lives of the unborn, the persecuted around the globe, and our family, friends, and allies in Israel. 
This is your moment to get in the fight. Every tax-deductible gift you give will be doubled through the ACLJ Life and Liberty Drive, giving you twice the impact to defend your freedoms and help us fight to literally save lives. This is your time. Go to aclj.org right now and join us in this fight. Keeping you informed and engaged, now more than ever, this is Seculo. And now your host, Logan Seculo. This is Logan Seculo. Will Haynes joining me in studio as well, executive producer and Jordan Seculo joining me live from Washington, D.C., executive director of the ACLJ. Uh, we are going to kick this off with a phone call or two because I know a lot of you are still on hold about what you probably saw as the topic line if you're watching on YouTube or Rumble, which is that, yes, President Biden off the ballot in yet another state due to their own mistakes. Let's go to Thomas in Maryland on line five to kick off the half hour, right? Thomas, you're on the air. Uh, thank you for taking my call. I really appreciate you, uh, ACLJ. Um, I heard something over the weekend, and I thought you could settle it for me. Is Joe Biden's health condition and how his cabinet is treating him considered elder abuse? If so, how can we keep people accountable? Um, Thomas, I think that that's obviously been an ongoing question of of who's really pulling the strings here, who's really making the decisions, and uh, how much of it's look. You've even seen seen President Biden make a statement, let's say in in text, and then come out the next day with something vastly different. Uh, not a typical situation for a presidency, Jordan, but it's just where we're at right now. No, and and elder abuse is something again. That's your family would have to allege that. So it's not like. The, the cabinet or the government or the U.S. government is somehow guilty of that. Uh, here, he put himself forward, his family, they make that decision to put himself forward as president. He ran, he uh, and now he is running for re-election, and so they're making that decision together. And so that would be a family issue, not one where you would go after the, the cabinet for somehow, uh, uh, you know, uh, abusing uh, Joe Biden. Now, listen, his competency Sure, that can be an issue in this election cycle. I think it's very fair when you have a president and one running for re-election, both at this age of their life. Yeah, absolutely. Let's uh, let's continue on. Let's try and take one more call. And then in the next segment, we're going to really break down with you and Harry Hutchinson some new uh, updates Will the FISA situation. That's right. So, uh, it'll be a lot of fun coming up here in the next segment. But so many of you have been holding for close to half an hour now. Let's go to Elvin, who's calling in California, on line one. Elvin, you're on the air. Hi, uh, thank you. So... You know, ignorance of the law is no excuse. If if Joe Biden is too incompetent to follow the law, then he has to experience the consequences just like anybody else would. You know, and even if you're in high school or in college and you don't turn in your assignment on time, you get a zero. So why why does he get an exception? That would not be fair. Well, Elvin, I think some people are saying that. I'm seeing that in the comments. What do you think, people, in the comments on YouTube and Rumble? I'd love to hear from you on Elvin's response there. But, Jordan, we have sort of been preaching a bit of, okay, likely President Biden individually is not the person to blame here. But like that last caller said, there's other people who are making some big mistakes because their eye is off the ball. Yeah, but I also believe that because of the way that we hold the conventions and the way the states have – I did some more research on this when I was flying up to D.C., Logan, and, and it's it's in most of the articles, that all every state before that's faced this issue, either from a Democrat or Republican, has made an exception. Yeah. So this has happened before, and the reason why is because typically these are made-for-TV events where the party who is not in charge of the presidency, so this year like, the Republican Party goes first, in, and, and then the Democrat Party goes second, and you try to time it up around other events like this year there's the olympics and they're in paris so what's the time zone there and what's going to be airing here so that you can get as many people that want uh to watch this uh again to make decisions about who they may want to vote for as president of the united states as the parties kind of put their best foot forward and remember this will be again different than the covid version of this for the first time right. in uh, four years. So it's a, it's yeah, a different the first convention really in eight years of traditional, or traditional right. convention. Right. Those were, we had those very, very made for TV events yeah. that were, again, uh, a lot House different lawn. than yeah. the people on the floor. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, we're headed into a break. Uh, in the next segment, we are going to dive pretty deep uh, into some of the new fights over FISA, Will. That's right. As the House has a deadline to reauthorize FISA or change it, 
In just a few weeks, we're going to break it down with Harry Hutchison and Jordan from D.C., who's been meeting with our team there yep. about these very issues. Yep, phone lines are open, too, if you want to get your voice on the air. What we'll do is we'll talk to Harry and Jordan coming up, and then after that, we'll take as many calls as we possibly can. So 1-800-684-3110, 1-800-684-3110. We'll be right back. The federal government is looking to expand this uh, ability to bring lawsuits against former presidents to a point where, you know, we said, remember, in uh, the lower court in D.C., we were concerned about that appeals court basically saying that presidents lose all of their immunity the moment they're no longer president. And you think, wow, so you have this, you have, you have CIA black ops that are not even you know, written down on paper, where we know that there are technically laws being violated. I mean, that's why they, they are off book, but yet they're funded by the government. Everybody knows these exist. Could you prosecute if you found out one of those that went wrong? Like you tar- mistargeted uh, an al-Zahiri and you killed an American citizen and a minor, which Barack Obama did? President Obama uh, issued a drone policy which led to the killing of an American citizen, um, Anwar Alawaki, on October the, 20, on the October the 14th, 2011. That was a drone strike, and arguably, if Jack Smith is correct, we could now prosecute President Obama. Similarly, President Obama ordered the extrajudicial killing of Osama bin Laden. I am sure that some international law was breached by that activity, although it was supported, I would submit, by the majority of American people. So there has to be, in my judgment, some limitation placed on Jack Smith's very broad theory. Presidents are entitled uh, to engage in acts that are designed to ensure the effective functioning of the executive branch. Jack Smith wants to take that right away, and I think the Supreme Court should deny it. Welcome back to Seculo. We are joined by Harry Hutchinson in the studio, as well as Will Haynes and Jordan Seculo, coming to us live from Washington, D.C. In the next segment, I want to take as many phone calls as I can. So if you want to give us a call, this is a great time to do it. 1-800-684-3110. It could be about this topic we're about to discuss right now. It could be about the life situation. It could be even the what you saw in the headline here, which is that Joe Biden off the ballot in yet another state currently in the state of Alabama. But Jordan, I'll let you take it from here because uh, we have some pretty sure. uh, interesting developments. So, right, so FISA, we've been talking about for years, has been abused, and we believe it was abused so much um, leading up into the first uh, Trump uh, campaign where we had FISA courts being used to spy on American citizens when it's, again, when the name of the court is a Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act court, it's the FISC, it's not supposed to be a court to spy on Americans. So we said this this has to be, after you heard about Carter Page and you saw what happened to you know, Papadopoulos in the, the, the Steele dossier, that either this needed to be abolished or radically changed uh, bef- next time this goes up for review. Now, right now, because Congress is so divided, I don't think you're going to see it be abolished. I don't think you're going to see radical changes. But you could see some changes. And here's here's our kind of position at the ACLJ. There's either going to be some changes to FISA or... On April 19th, likely the House and Senate will just pass a full reauthorization with no changes. That means, for instance, Logan, like some of the proposed changes go to politics, for instance, so that if you got something like the Steele dossier, that would be prohibited for use. So it would prohibit the use of politically derived information in FISA court applications unless the organization is identified, information is corroborated, and corroboration steps are identified. So the FBI can't just take the Steele dossier and go get a FISA warrant. They'd have to actually basically corroborate all the steps themselves. We knew once they did that, they found out it was a bogus document, and they would not have been able to put that through to the court. Another issue is actually having to go and get a warrant first before you start uh, wiretapping American citizens. Now, again, why are we talking about American citizens? It's because 
under FISA, if you are, again, talking to, and we believe you're a foreign agent, uh, you somehow lose your American rights under the Constitution, though you're not in court, and they can get a warrantless wiretap on your phone. So Cong- some congressmen are proposing putting in a warrant requirement there. But there's not clear support for that because the intelligence community says if we have to do that, we lose all of our speed, and so you might as well not have this court system. So we'll see if the warrant stays in. But some of these other, again, prohibitions, at least it's a start, Logan, because we need a lot more support in Washington, D.C. That means elected officials in Washington, D.C., on in both the House, the Senate, and the White House, to actually make serious reforms to FISA or rethink this whole system and maybe come up with something new that does still protect Americans the way it's supposed to in a post-9-11 world without being so politically involved. I mean, it also has to prohibit the use of press reports in applications unless those press reports are actually corroborated. I mean, think about that, Logan. Right now, you could literally take an article from whatever source, and the FBI can use that as their reason to spy on you. Yeah, I mean, it's sadly not that shocking. I mean, I feel like that has been the case for a long time, whether that uh, is, is on the state level, the federal level. I feel like there's always something, there's always something yeah. little they can grasp at to go after a lot of Americans, uh, whether, again, whether that's on the local level, level or the federal level. And, Jordan, we talk about kind of the most high-profile example of the FISA court being, and FISA process being abused, obviously being the Trump campaign in 20. 20- Uh, 16 when they were spying on the presidential candidate but in 2020 alone the court found 278,000 violations of the FISA Act and the FISA court process that's just in 2020 when you extrapolate that out and I know that the Wall Street Journal did some reporting that there were millions of of improperly accessed phone records of Americans sure this isn't just high profile presidential candidates these are everyday Americans that are losing Fourth Amendment protections through this entire process. I mean, think about how many Americans may make a foreign phone call or have someone that calls from overseas, and that somehow triggers the ability for these systems to start listening in, and are you supposed to be masked and covered? And uh, some of the reforms they are pushing, guys, uh, from the Republican side is a reform commission to look at, like we said, to really look at, a complete redo of this, which I think, again, it's hard to like piecemeal this one back together and make it good again, but also is an annual report that gets declassified about how many Americans were, uh, were you that they used to use this system to actually go after. And uh, again, we talk about the high profile stuff. We talk about the political because that's about the worst, right? When you think about your FBI and your law enforcement and intelligence communities getting involved uh, and the Department of Justice getting involved in, you know, tipping the scales of American elections based off news articles and a foreign, uh, well, basically opposition research that isn't corroborated. So I, 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 I'm a campaign. I do opposition research. That's not strange at all. I hand that to a FISA court or somebody at DOJ like they did, and they go in. And that is, that is again, that's a serious attack on the uh, security of our elections, but also uh, the integrity of our elections. I know that's like a bad word to talk about. You're not supposed to talk about these things. But when you talk about whether or not the elections are legitimate and secure, it's not just the part about voting. It's also the information that comes out about those candidates and whether and when it comes out from like a official source, but you realize the official source was taking it from a campaign and like stamp, just putting a stamp on it like that, so that they could do their own spying inside the Trump campaign. Uh, you know, people don't necessarily, again, that official stamp makes people think it, it's true. And that is what some of these reforms are trying to get at. I hope we get some of these reforms through, and then ultimately there's a new generation of members of Congress coming through who realize, listen, we need something to protect us that law enforcement can do quickly when it comes to foreign actors. But that is not when it comes to Americans and we probably need to toss this out the uh, toss this out the window, but we can't really do that. They're going to say until you've got the replacement ready to go. And so far, no replacement yet. And Harry, you are uh, not only uh, one of our our policy directors here, but also uh, a professor of law by trade. And 
one of the issues I see here when you break it down is that this gets to the heart of what civil rights are for Americans. And if this continues on a status quo, it's a blank check for these agencies to continue to violate that in perpetuity. You're precisely correct, Will. So all private citizens are protected by the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. But in order to protect the Fourth Amendment rights of the American people, we first need to do something that is not in any of the proposals, the proposals for reform. We need to reform the culture of the FBI. They need to reestablish their commitment to the rule of law. So FBI insiders note that what is most important is reforming the FBI and its culture so they are willing to obey existing rules. So part of the problem with respect to the FISA court is the FBI has misused FISA for its own political purposes, I think, as Jordan eloquently points out. So the FBI, for instance, has gone after uh, school parents uh, who are protesting at school board meetings. It's gone after traditionalist Catholics. So what the FBI has done is it's put its finger on the scale, and that is what is so objectionable to the American people. So, yes, FISA does need to be reformed, and FISA needs uh, courage on the, uh, let me rephrase that, uh, Congress needs courage to reform FISA, but at the end of the day, what is most essential is reforming the FBI. Thank you, Harry, for that analysis. I think hopefully everyone has a better idea of what this all means and what we can do moving forward. And, of course, we can't do any of this work. We can't put on this broadcast right now without the support of ACLJ uh, donors, ACLJ champions. Those are people like you who are watching this broadcast, who are listening on the radio, who say, I really enjoy not only the content they provide, the education they just pro they just provided, but also the incredible legal work that's happening. Said Jordan's in Washington, D.C. coming up. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, we only have a minute left in this segment. Then we come back and we try to take as many calls and comments as possible. Even if you're just watching right now, I'm going to ask you to call in 1-800-684-3110. Even if it's just to say thank you for the work or to, to talk to us or, or to have a comment. You don't even have to have a question. I'd love to hear from you. We can talk about the FISA situation. We can talk about Biden being off the ballot. We can talk about protecting life around the country or anything else. Uh, we'd love to hear from you again at 1-800-684-3110. We are in the middle of that life and liberty drive right now. So go to ACLJ.org as we start and continue to fight in all 50 states to protect life. You can be a part of it. You can join us and become a monthly supporter of the ACLJ as an ACLJ champion. Go to ACLJ.org. All your gifts will be doubled. And Jordan, it's a very important time. We only got about 20 seconds, but I think people need to know you're up there in Washington, D.C., doing the hard work. It is. And I'll talk in a minute. We come back about what we're doing in D.C. today. But we are also expanding our offices in D.C. and our government affairs work, our policy work, and our studio in D.C. to provide you more live updates from Washington. Award-winning editor Yuri Berliner exposing the political bias and why he says NPR has lost America's trust. I got so frustrated with what I saw was the sort of the lack of different perspectives in our coverage that I decided to look at voter registration you know, among our staff. And what I found was 87 registered Democrats on our editorial staff, zero Republicans. I presented this at a uh, at a all hands or a large news meeting and i said hey look something's gone wrong here do you know how brave this guy is he's still working at npr he still walks into the newsroom he's just come out with this huge interview this yeah. big piece <laughs> and he's just going to work like everything's fine that takes courage he then went on to blast his own organization for morphing from a left-leaning news operation into an extreme far-left political machine focused on, quote, efforts to damage or topple Donald Trump's presidency. NPR just put out a statement saying they stand by their reporting and inclusion is very important. When I started, 
there was a liberal orientation, but I think it, we were more guided by curiosity, open-mindedness. You know, you said, talked about policy. Um, we were kind of nerdy and really d- like to dig into things and understand the complexity of things. That I think that's evolved over the years into a much narrower kind of niche thinking, a group thing. In the name of diversity, they've eliminated diversity of thought. And in the name of inclusion, they've created this culture of exclusion where certain points of view representing over 50 percent of the population in this country just aren't welcome. But on the positive side, Jesse, I want to say that took a lot of courage for that reporter, this guy, Yuri Berliner. I want to congratulate him as a guy who probably disagrees with him on the substance of a lot of political issues. I still respect his willingness to come out and tell the truth. Welcome back to Secular. We are taking your calls in this final segment, 1-800-684-3110. If you're just watching on uh, Facebook or Rumble or YouTube or ACLJ.org, you saw a video package about that sort of expose that came out of Barry Weiss's publication, the Free Press, about uh, sort of the not only a liberal bias that was coming out of NPR, but really, uh, which I think we all assumed it was there, even us that enjoy listening to NPR or have enjoyed some of their content over the years, you always kind of knew there was a, a bid to it. But they came up with a pretty big expose, and I think I encourage you all to watch that but, and, and to read that article because it's just fascinating as someone who follows news media to really uh, see what's actually going on in some of these newsrooms. But, Jordan, I wanted to, before we get to any of these calls, sure. give you some time to talk about what's happening in Washington, D.C. Sure, bringing our, our legal and, and government affairs team together. We're expanding our work here, uh, you know, looking towards, uh, of course, the next election and preparing for multiple outcomes in the House, the Senate, and, of course, the White House. So we're actually expanding our, our, um, our on-the-ground office space here on Capitol Hill. People have seen in a lot of our videos our, our main headquarters building here in D.C., which is uh, right behind the Supreme Court and Caddy Corner to the U.S. Senate Hart Building. We purchased another building that's next door as well. So we basically have this corner at 2nd and Maryland here in Washington, D.C. So we'll be able to expand our studio space, uh, which will uh, take this out of the, the basement uh, where we've been uh, on Capitol Hill. Uh, and be able to invite more members of Congress, too, and individuals from other groups to join us there, and also more team members from D.C. Uh, to do broadcasting or even updates for people throughout the day online. And uh, more office space. We're out of office space. That's a good, it's a good place to be uh, as an organization. That's because of your financial support, of course, uh, which means, uh, again, uh, we, we are going to b- both be expanding our legal team and our, our policy and government affairs team uh, to best represent you here in the nation's capital. Yeah, it's really amazing what's going on, uh, whether it's in our studios here or whether that's in Washington, D.C. As you said, get yourself out of the basement. A lot of people hear about the D.C. swamp, but we are the D.C. basement there at the, at the ACLJ which studios. Which is quite swampy. Which has been, yeah, yeah it, it can get warm. and it's been We've been in there for... It's warm right now. These buildings are, <laughs> are old. They've been there for a long time. Uh, so we have it's been about there... 75 the, degrees in the, in the studio right now. <laughs> yeah. So we will be upgrading our studios. We'll be upgrading our offices and really uh, get in really in-depth into some more work at the ACLJ. So we yeah, I mean, and when, when we're here, like on these days, Logan, I mean, we, we take advantage of obviously our time when we're when we're able to be in D.C. and with this team here. We're going to be with a U.S. senator for a couple of hours, uh, you know, really, you know, off the, you know, kind of real dis- real discussions, not not uh, just for interviews and uh, media purposes. Right. So we'll, we'll be doing that. We're meeting with some corporations as well. Again, real discussions we're having that aren't like on the record just for media uh, yeah. to expand the ACLJ's work. Yeah, to make sure that we're there affecting policy and affecting change. Let's go ahead and take some phone calls. Uh, this one, I believe, is about the if – you, if you're just joining us, which a lot of you are, you probably saw the headline, which was the Biden off the ballot in another state. This was in the state of Alabama. Again, as we discussed the other day, essentially the convention is being held too late, the Democratic National Convention, to get Joe Biden certified to be on the ballot. And now two states, Ohio and Alabama, more will probably to come. So a lot of people are saying, well, do we bid the rules for Joe Biden? Do we be the, do you be the bigger man and go and say, you know what, we'll, we'll let him do this because we want a free and fair election? Or do you make him pay the consequences? Let's go to Charlie, who's calling in Oregon on line one. Charlie, welcome. Uh, yes, thank you for taking my call. Uh, I just had a comment. If we are going to make exceptions for Joe Biden to be on the ballot, are we going to make exceptions for RFK? Yeah, I mean, they're, I mean, RFK, they're right now currently fighting to get RFK on ballot in all right. 50 states. The they're difference. probably paying more attention, to be honest. A little bit of more of the difference, yeah. in, and Jordan can speak to this as well, is that the the established parties, the DNC and the RNC, already have 
a, a lot of the pre-work done for ballot access. When you're running as an independent candidate, there's signature requirements. There's um, a, a, an amount of money that you have to pay to be uh, getting ballot access and things of that nature that when you're an independent candidate, you don't have that infrastructure set up. So there is an uphill battle, but he's also probably working harder on it, as Logan said. Jordan, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, listen, it, it is different because you do. You have to get signatures, or in some states you can pay uh, You can pay to be on the ballot, and so that may make it easier for someone like RFK Jr. But, again, those states that require signatures, that's different than what we're talking about here. We're not talking about the Joe Biden didn't get the signatures. It's the actual nominating um, uh, the official nomination that comes from the convention that goes to the state uh, secretary of state so that they put you on the ballot. That's different. He'll, uh, he'll get those uh, likely from, from all the states from at his independent convention or whatever he decides to do. It's whether or not he actually qualified the earlier qualification to be on the ballot. That would be, that's a, that's a not exception that we've ever provided in the U S uh, we still say, hey, you want to run as a third party, you can, but you still have to meet the, re- the requirements that the law has allowed. That's either a check or signatures or a mix of both. All right, let's continue on. Let's go to Priscilla, who's calling in New York, watching on YouTube, which we appreciate. Uh, thanks for watching on YouTube. Priscilla, welcome. Hi there. Um, I'm going to try to make mine fast. I don't. If you're going to amend these deadlines, I don't think that Biden should be allowed to amend the deadlines because if you're going to amend deadlines for him for legal purposes, then whenever you have a criminal or some other civil suit, then you should be able to extend deadlines for everybody. What's the purpose of having a deadline if you're going to keep giving infinite deadlines? My second statement was, I don't, I don't think it's fair for the departments of state or telling the DNC how to fix their problems. They're supposed to be neutral and not be helping out one side, especially when they're breaking the law. Um, the third thing I wanted to say was um, when there were electoral problems voting in 2020, we went to the states to, you know, to decide how they were going to fix it. So um, it's not the Republicans' problem to fix the um, the problems caused by Biden. He ought to, you know, they ought to fix it themselves. Any chance we get, you know, if you want somebody in there, you should take any chance that makes the other side lose and use that to your advantage. Why help them out? And one last thing I wanted to say was that in Florida, um, Trump wanted to claim immunity, and the judge threw out his case saying, well, you had all this time to file, so he threw it out due to timeliness. So hey, if Priscilla, you I hate out- I hate to cut you off. We only have about a minute and a half left. I think we gave you – I mean, really appreciate your call, and I think we gave you as much time as Dr. Harry Hutchinson in the last segment. So <laughs> I appreciate you calling in with your comments and your feedback. Jordan, I did want to quickly, as we wrap this up, take this last call very quickly. Karen in New York, line one. Karen, go ahead. Yeah, hi, Jordan. Yeah, Jordan and Logan yeah. and Will. We're all here. Go ahead. Yeah. Hey, Karen. Yeah, thank- okay, I'm going to tell you guys again, like I said, thank you for everything that you do. My quick question is really, and it kind of covers the whole broad spectrum. How, how, how are these, and I'm going to just call them point blank out, how are these communists have been allowed to take over our country? Where are the people like, what do they sit back down with their hands on their seat and just let this happen? They have, they have infiltrated every level down to like, Stoves, cars, this and that. You can't make a move yeah, without you know, them destroying our lives. It's, it's happened good. in that. It, it's happened, Logan. We all can point exactly to where it started. It started in the education system. It took decades, but to convince the American people that they want some kind of radical change, and we're seeing that. I think the protests for Hamas, specifically after the horrific October seventh attacks, shows you just how much change there has been and how much work we have to do to ideologically educate uh, the American people, especially young people, about why this is the greatest country in the world and we need to preserve uh, and protect our liberties and freedoms, not get rid of them. And that is why we're here at the ACLJ. I can tell you one last time for the day, support the work of the ACLJ during this life and liberty drive. We only got 15 seconds left on this broadcast. I encourage you to go right now, scan that code, do what you need to do, go to aclj.org. Donations are matched through this month, and you can become an ACLJ champion. That's a monthly supporter right now. Do it. We'll be back tomorrow.